It's time for the College of Bass with Kevin Van Dam and Steve Panaz. Hey everybody, welcome to week eight of College of Bass. I gotta admit this is a little bit bittersweet tonight because this is our last episode uh, for the year. So have fun, we're gonna have a blast. We got some great giveaways tonight. We're gonna dedicate the entire episode to you guys tonight. So feed us your questions and uh, we're gonna have a ton of fun. Hey, and remember if you missed any of these uh, previous shows, they're housed on the YouTube channel for both Kevin's uh, page as well as Plano Fishing. So uh, you can catch them back then, and I can guarantee you they're worth going back and watching them because you'll, they're loaded with great fishing information. Hey, Kevin, um, welcome, man. It's good to see you. Man, I am uh, excited to be back. So I'm down in Sam Rayburn, Texas. You you always, every week, are like, you got a new background this week. Well, down here, it's challenging to find uh, <laughs> internet service anywhere. So I'm at Rayburn Country, at uh, actually at Brandon's hotel room here, because it's the only place where we've got enough speed to stream. So, so, uh, but I'm excited, man. I've got a fish in the morning again tomorrow. I've had a good week so far. Yeah, uh, you know, conditions hey, look good. Congrats on a very start, uh, strong start this week, man. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's good. I love uh, Sam Rayburn. It's a place I've got a lot of history. I've actually. I won a Bassmaster Invitational here a long time ago. The first time I ever seen the lake, I uh, set the five fish record. The first, my first competition day ever here. So uh, it was it. It's it's a great place. It has a lot of great memories. And around here, everybody lives and breathes bass fishing. This whole area revolves around the bass in this lake. That's really cool. Now you guys yeah. are forecast to have some pretty big wind tomorrow. Do you think that's going to affect uh, a lot of anglers? Yeah, um, you know, I always say the wind is your friend, but, you know, out here it can get real rough. It makes it hard to move around. And with the lake level, the way that it is right now, it's just right at full pool. Um, it can it can muddy up some of the areas and things like that, too. We've had we had big storms the start of yesterday and, uh, you know, got a pretty good batch of rain from that. So it it muddied the back of the creeks and, and things like that. So it, it's been changing every day, but that's normal. I mean, it's early spring fishing, you know, water temperatures are on the rise. This lake is about to bust wide open any day. So I'm hoping it's tomorrow while I'm fishing. <laughs> so under the MLL format, is it hard to take a break? I mean, do you feel like you lose some of the momentum or, or understanding what the fish are doing? You know, in these first rounds, um, you know, where there's 40 guys the first day and then the opposite group of 40 fishes the second day, having that day off, things change a lot. So being able to, um, you know, to jump right back in there, it, you know, it's, it's easy to lose that momentum. You know, I, I like fishing every single day, but, uh, I also like having, you know, the, the so-called day off, you know, I've had a busy day today doing media stuff and, uh, television and other podcasts and, and things like that. But, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So tomorrow's the knockout round. Oh, you know, I, I need to make the top eight. Um, you know, the first winners of the first two rounds, they already move on. So there's just eight more of us. And Friday's the championship round. And I'd really like to be there because, you know, each day, you know, after each cut, we go back to zero. And so it's like a fresh slate. And and you have to bring it every single round. You know, you have to be on, the, on your A game. And, uh, you know, if you can get off to a fast start, things uh, – you know, things can do, you know, go real well for you. And so I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to do that tomorrow. That's awesome. Hey, hey, we've got a great show tonight. We've got, we're going to take viewer questions the entire night. So start feeding us your questions as we go through. And we got some great giveaways in addition to our, our regular giveaways, which is fun. We also got a couple really awesome guests tonight. Edwin Evers is going to be on board as, as well as Brian Brosdahl, uh, co-host of College of Ice. So he's going to be uh, coming in uh, in a little bit. Hey, we need to congratulate uh, Brian Silwanis. That's he. He actually sent in his uh, his address, Kevin, and gave us the pronunciation of his name with it. So <laughs> I, I, you did a great job getting him uh, uh, out last week. But he's out of Rockledge, Florida. So he's going to win the uh, the Plano Prize Pack. And everybody watching tonight is eligible to win this uh, last prize pack tonight. It's got a couple of great edge boxes the KVD signature bag, some great lures, some Strike King, and the College 
of bass yeti tumblers so uh you know we're gonna have a winner tonight so stick around uh tonight at the end which is which is really cool hey we've also got a, a in honor of episode eight tonight we've got a a great uh a great special from plano buy two kvd uh worm file speed bags and you get a free college of bass yeti rambler hey kevin i know you're a big fan yeah. of the, uh, speed bags i am as well yeah, the speed bags are awesome for plastics. You know, I mean, we have the large size and then the, the standard size. And, you know, when you have baits like Rage Craws or Rage Swimmers, you know, that come in those clam packaging, you need to keep them from uh, from getting bent or kinked or anything like that. You don't want to uh, have the integrity of the action. So these speed bags are designed perfect for your plastics. I have, uh, you know, eight to 10 always in my boat and I just change them out. You know, I keep all my, again, rodents in one or um, drop shot, you know, baits, whatever it is. And, and then just, you know, use what I mean, uh, need for that, for that day or have them in the boat. And a lot of times I have them all. So they're just a great system to organize your plastics. I still have yellow ones. I still have blue ones that date back in every years. But uh, yeah, they really are awesome. You're looking for soft plastic storage. Hey, and by the way, that, that special runs through uh, Sunday. It's already up and running on the PlanoMolding.com uh, site. So go there. And we know it's going to run out. Uh, we were running fairly short on some of these mugs now. So if you want yeah. this, take advantage of it. Order it tonight. Yeah. Uh, and we did have a question from uh, Daryl Ekstrom. He said, hey, are there any mugs left? And uh, yeah, there are, but they're running out. And he wanted one to patch, believe it or not, his College of Ice mug, which uh, he's been a well, lot of viewers. So. The other thing, too, is all the proceeds from these go to the Professional Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. So you're, you know, you're helping a, a great cause and, uh, you know, something that's obviously uh, great for all of us. So. Yeah. Uh, and it's cool. I mean, I, the, that Yeti Rambler mug is the one sponsor product. I use it every single day. I mean, I put coffee in in the morning. I've got it full of uh, right now we got Aquafina, but I want to have it ice cold. And I, I just keep it. I have it with me all the time in my truck and it's in the boat. It's just perfect. You know, so they, yeah. they really are amazing. Hey, last week we had uh, uh, Plato Pro Ryan Latimer on, and Blat. Uh, it was really obvious from the comments that he's a, got a very strong following, which was which was cool. But the topics for the night were electronics and deep cranking, and we had tons of questions. So I want to get to as many as we can right now. We got the first one is actually from Matt Ort uh, Loff. He says, "How far?" past where you think the fish are do you cast your deep cranks well th that's the thing so you you know with a crankbait like a strike king xd series really any of the sizes they have a real steep dive angle so you've got to be at least a third farther of the distance for that bait to get down to the bottom in in most cases you know so it's not going to get its maximum depth and and so if you make a you know a 60 yard cast uh with a 6xd for instance you know i want to you know i want to have the the fish halfway between. So I know that I'm in the zone, the bait's down there on the bottom. So it's all about feel and positioning. It's something you can, you can get figured out, but that bait needs to be on the bottom where the bass are at. That's awesome. Hey, uh, Bill Tharp asked a question. He said, what's the best time, or best way to fish for spawning fish that you can't actually see? Well, we end up having to do this at a lot of the lakes we go to, especially, you know, places in Florida and that where the water's dirty or they're scattered in grass. And the, the biggest thing there is, is just trying to understand what they spawn around. So if you're fishing along a lily pad edge or a Kissimmee grass line or something like that, or just down a bank, you know, next to a stump, when you get to a high percentage zone or a hole in the grass, leave that bait soak a little longer. You want it to, you know, you want it to sit there, you know, just like if you were sight fishing for one, it takes a lot of, you know, sometimes two or three casts to antagonize them into biting or more. So you have to think about that when you're blind fishing for spawning fishes. Just be more patient, let the bait sit longer, and in those high percentage zones, make multiple casts. Hey, we just had a question come in from Jeff uh, Kotelik. He says, do you think the Mega 360 will take a backseat to the Mega Live that's coming out? Um, I, I'll tell you that I don't, I love the Mega 360 and because it's so good at, seeing the structure around the boat. I mean, it, it is a, it's probably the main reason that I'm in the knockout round here at Sam Rayburn. You know, I'm using it to follow these grass lines. I can see the holes in the grass. I'm following the edges. I'm casting to them. I'm casting to these irregularities to get the bites that, I, that I'm getting. So uh, I can't imagine, I haven't used the live yet. So what I want to do is use them both in unison. So uh, 
I, I don't know if we'll be able to see them at the same time on the same screen, but I will have two graphs if I have to, to use both. There's, there's no doubt they each have. You might be going to five graphs. I might have to have six. You never know. I mean, <laughs> wow. That's um, awesome. It, you know, when you're, when you're competing as a professional and people will say, well, man, that's just crazy or I can't afford to, to spend that. But this is what I do for a living. You, you know, you have to, to be competitive, you have to embrace technology. And right now we're in the golden era of technology. And it's just, it's just such uh, an improvement to any angler's game. And if you don't have it, you're, you know, you're behind. So you have to embrace that technology. Hey, we had a question uh, from Randall Heron. He says, talk about upgrading hook sizes on cranks and lipless baits. Yeah. So I, you know, I use my must add KVDs and they're ultra short. I mean, they're, they're an extra short shank hook, but they got a real wide gap. So it allows me to upsize and not have the hooks tangle. So like, a KVD 1.5, I I put two number twos, a half ounce red eye shad, two number twos. You know, jerk baits, you, if you put too big of hooks on them, they start to sink and you lose the balance. So baits like top waters and jerk baits that are real weight sensitive, you got to be a little more careful on, on your hook sizes. So I experiment, but I really like to go as a general rule on my crank baits to go up at, you know, one size from what they come with. So if they come with round bend number fours, I'll go to the twos. If they come with number twos, I'll go to a number one or even a one aught in those, in those KVD extra wide gaps. It, it just is, um, you know, I, I just have so much confidence in them. When you get a bite with them, it just locks them in place. That style that, uh, and, and the gap is so wide because the shank is so short, you're not giving anything up from, from going away from a standard round bend. You know, it's amazing, though, how hooks have really improved oh. over the last decade and even even the last five, six years. They've, they've, yeah, the, the sharpness and the durability, um, you know, these black nickel finishes, you know, if you bend one or nick one, you can sharpen them, but it's it's better just to replace it. You can't make it as sharp as the factory can. That's amazing. Hey, we got another question. Uh, John Meyer asked a question. Where do you run your sensitivity and contrast on your mega and your side imaging? Yep. So um, the biggest thing you want to do is look at your your picture clarity. So I, I, you know, I really look at the setup of it. And I think a lot of people get some interference and stuff when they're they're trying to adjust the sensitivity or contrast because of actually electric issues in their boat rigging. So I have dedicated power to my electronics. I mean, I don't they don't go through the master uh, switch on the console. I have straight power to the units on the front and straight power to the units on the console. And that makes a big difference in the clarity of that you see on the screen. I mean, I do screenshots and people say, man, mine isn't that clear. Well, I, I finally figured out that most people don't have their electronics probably wired right uh, to, to get that. So you don't really have to change the sensitivity a lot. It, the only th time that I do is if you're really trying to scan way out, say I'm at Lake St. Clair, and or Lake Erie, and I'm just covering a big flat looking for boulders, and, and I'm trying to look out 100 or 125 feet further out, that's when you want to adjust, you know, you want more power, right? So you increase the sensitivity. The other thing that I do is experiment with the different palette colors um, for it. My favorite is the amber too, is kind of that amber base, but um, you know, like for brush pot, looking for brush piles and things like that, the green really stands out. And for certain people, different colors um, just show things better, especially in subtle detail. So uh, I know a lot of people like the blue, um, you know, I mean, everybody's across the board. That's why they have all the different colors. So you can personalize it to what your eyes see the best in that situation. And it, it's just great to, to change from one to the other and just see how a grass line looks or a brush pile or a rock pile, you know. Or how it looks in the sun. I know, I, I, you, as you know, I run Garmin, and and the, those are the two colors that I go to a lot, especially the, the emerald yeah. green and the and the amber. Yeah. Hey, another question on color. Justin Evans asked. He says, "Does braid uh, color matter? Can fish see bright colors?" I've got a yeah. strong feeling on this. Yeah, I do too. They absolutely see braid, and I think they feel braid. You know, it, it just it has more. It uh, doesn't cut through the water like fluorocarbon does. It, it displaces water and I think they can feel the vibration off a big diameter braid. But, you know, I color the, if I'm using straight braid on a frog or a swim jig or anything like that, I'm going to use a black marker. I know like Greg Hackney, he likes red. He likes to color his red, but we want to darken it up, especially if you're fishing grass and stuff, make it blend in 
uh, with the surroundings if you can, or use a fluorocarbon leader. You know, on a spinning rod, I'm pretty much using a fluorocarbon leader and I will make that leader longer in real clear water. I don't want those fish to, I don't want them to see that braid. I'm trying to do everything to camouflage it, but I like to see it. So, you know, with a spinning rod, using that nice bright yellow braid with a floral leader is great. But on a bait caster, I'm using that, you know, dark green braid. So it blends in with the surroundings. I got a funny story. We were doing a, a television episode one time. I had a, a charter captain uh, mic'd up and he didn't know we were listening to him. And he was complaining to his first mate that Panaz brought all these lock out half these rods with a bright green line. First six bites were on, on the on the bright green line. So I, I sent him a spool for Christmas. So that was a, yeah. a, a fun day. <laughs> the, the fish were see it and follow it to the bait, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Hey, uh, Pete Heine says, uh, do longer shadows mean fish uh, is further away when using side imaging? I, I think side imaging is still one of those things that a lot of people still don't understand completely. Yep. So when you see a large shadow on your side imaging, that that object is just higher, taller off the bottom. OK, so like a piece of timber or a brush, the, the higher it is, the longer the shadow is going to be, the shorter it is, the shorter that shadow is going to be. So if you see it off of a fish, um, it's a, it's going to be a big fish. I, I've seen very few bass ever on side imaging that throw big shadows, you know. Um, typically when you see a group of them, they're going to be real light colored. The bass is real, almost white on your side imaging and you're not going to see much of a shadow. Now, what I have seen big shadows of is like the Asian carp on Kentucky Lake or um, earlier this year when, when I was down at Texas, I was practicing for Red Crest at Lake Palestine and I got into an area and there's giant buffalo. I mean, I saw these fish on my three, mega 360 and I'm like, whoa, what are those? And uh, I threw a crankbait out there and I caught about a 40 pounder. And I'm like, oh, now I know what they are. I mean, when you got a fish that big, um, they're going to they're going to do that. But typically, you know, for your, you know, a, a one pounder, two pound bass or, you know, three pound bass, it's not going to it's not going to show a big shadow. The shadow is more the height of it or, you know, how close it is to it. The more intense the, uh, you know, the image is on it, uh, you're, you're going to see it. So at 30 feet it's going to throw a bigger shadow than it is at a hundred feet, just like a flashlight beam in the dark. That's how you got to look at, you know, how a flashlight beam hits a tree or an object and, and the shadow that it leaves behind it. Just like if you were standing out there in the dark, that's how side imaging looks. Hey, this next question is from Joe uh, Trebolt. I think I pronounced his name right. He says, how do you maintain your health? I mean, I look at you, you look looking like you're buff. You look like you're ripped. I mean, you're <laughs> bouncing around all the time. But you know what? I, I mean, I know a lot of anglers, and, and I'm dealing with it right now, with fishing elbow and, and things like yep. that. What do you do to keep in shape? One of the most important things to do is, just like any athlete, is you need to stretch before you start your day. Um, you know, I do finger stretches, arm stretches, elbow, shoulders, knees, all of that. Just just take 10 minutes when you're getting ready before you go out there and, and stretch uh, everything out. And when you get there, you know, like in cranking season, the worst thing you could do is pull up on your first spot and, and bomb a 70 yard cast with a 10 XD out there, you know, give it, you want to ease into it. You got to warm up just again, just like any NFL player would or a hockey player, or any other athlete, you want to warm up and you definitely have to stretch out before you, uh, before you get out there and do it and, and do, you know, stretches specifically for those areas, for your wrists, your elbows, and your hands. That's the most important things. Stretch your shoulders out, spend some time uh, doing that. You know, I have never been a huge workout fan, uh, Over, but as, you know, as I've gotten older, I've had to, you know, I mean, I do sit-ups in the morning, I do some push-ups. I don't want to do, I'm not lifting heavy weights and, and doing extreme things like that, but just things that cardio-wise to, to go, because the most important thing you can do as a professional angler is be 100% on your game for all eight hours. If you're getting tired at the end of the day, you're not, you know, you're not going to reach your your true potential. That's that's amazing. I'm in a, uh, I'm in actual treatment. There was a point where I could not pick up a mug like this with my hand. It was that bad, and we're getting there. So we're uh, working with a company called Stay Active. So we're going to keep people yep. posted on how that goes forward. Hey, uh, I'd like to bring in Edwin Evers tonight. Uh, Everybody knows Edwin's a stud. I mean, he's the winner of the 2019 Red Crest, the MLF uh, Bass Pro Tour Stage 2 in Conroe, and he won the Bass Pro Tour Angler of the Year, uh, which is really uh, fun. Edwin, uh, welcome to College of Bass. Uh, great to see you, man. Thanks for having me. I, uh, 
I'm excited because both you and Kevin are going are in first place going in tomorrow. Yeah. We are. We are. We're, <laughs> We're just hoping to both be there at the end of the day. <laughs> so uh, t- tell us a little bit of how the week's gone for you so far down at uh, down at uh, Sam Rayburn. You know, it's been kind of a, a difficult week. You know, I, I have to remind myself multiple times, hey, this is Sam Rayburn and, and not some other lake. I, I am blown away by the lack of fish catches and, and how tough it is. I feel like this is one of the lakes in the country that I know really well, just as Kevin does, that we fished it so many times throughout the year. And uh, I'm still scratching my head, you know, but I'm really looking forward to tomorrow because I feel like I'm one day closer to figuring them out and, and getting better with those fish. So, uh it's just i think it's that funny window right before fish maybe go up to spawn and i'm sure this cold front had a lot more effect on them than than i gave credit for and uh you know there's been a lot of pressure but you know we'll get them figured out it's gonna it's gonna bust wide open i guarantee you before the week's over yeah i, I asked full kevin, moon on sunday so it's yeah. coming hey i'd asked kevin a little bit earlier is having a day off does that uh do you like it or do, is does it kind of make you lose your mojo a little bit some days i like it and today I, i'm glad i had it i needed to clear my head after my day yesterday and uh I, I i'm in a lot better state of mind right now than i would have been if i had to go up and start fishing at eight o'clock in the morning you know just after such a brutal day of, of trying everything that i know to catch bass you know and uh uh so today was one of those days that i really liked having a day off just be able to think about it and regroup Hey, we've had a, a ton of questions come in. I'd like to ask I, both of you guys this first one. Um, you know, the, the question that came in, he says, uh, do you use fluorocarbon on spinning rods? Um, so how do you guys set up your spinning rods? And, and it, obviously, some there's, there can be some challenges with heavier fluoro on there. But talk to me, uh, Edwin, if you'd start on that. Uh, what do you, how do you like to fish your fluorocarbon? I like to have braid with a fluorocarbon leader. I just man, you know, you have a lot less issues as far as line twist and, you know, you can cast braid so much further. Uh, It's just a lot softer, more limp line than than fluorocarbon. Um, You know, I guess there's probably a few instances if I'm throwing like a little spy bait or a little crank bait or something that I want that fluorocarbon. But for the most part, I'm all braid with a fluorocarbon leader. Kevin, how about you? Yeah, I'm pretty much, I'm, I'm similar. I do probably throw fluorocarbon a little more. I like to throw you know, my deep, small swim baits and things like that on straight floral, just because, you know, the sink rate on it, it just, it just works good. And like you say, for a spy bait, um, you know, braid just has the buoyancy to it. So if you, if you need something that, you know, you need to keep it down or have it in the middle of the water column, it just is straight floral is still an advantage, but more and more, um, I'm using more braid with a fluorocarbon leader, always a fluorocarbon leader. And, and I like a pretty long leader in clear water, but just advantages of, uh, you know, the distance and the sensitivity and just not having the headaches of having that. I call them woofers when you make that cast and you get a big ball of fluorocarbon at the first guide. You know, it just, uh, you know, most most pros now are primarily using braid with a fluorocarbon leader for almost everything spinning. So when you say long leader, Kevin, how long are you going? Uh, I like a, I use a 30 foot leader a lot, you know, especially on the Great Lakes and that, you know, down here, if you're if you're you know, sight fishing around in the, in the bushes and things like that. You don't need a very long leader. A 10 foot leader is, is fine, but uh, on the great lakes and that real clear water, I've just seen them be real line shy to that, to that braided line. Uh, I don't want them to see it at all, even up in the water column. So I tend to use a longer leader than most. Edwin, how long are you running typically? I don't like reeling the leader into my into my reel. I feel like there's been some times when I'll go to make a cast and that knot, for whatever reason, will catch somewhere on that bail. So uh, generally, you know, I'm listening with ears wide open here to Kevin's, but for me, my leader is always, it never gets into my reel unless I'm drop shot. And if I'm drop yeah. shot, then I'm just dropping it straight down off the side of the boat. But, you know, if I'm casting it, I don't want that leader down that knot into my reel because I feel like there's some times, you know, just it may happen one in 20, but somehow that knot will get entangled into that spinning reel when I open the bail and it doesn't come off properly. Yeah. The one thing I bet you is you use an FG knot, I'm guessing. I I don't do anything but an FG knot. I I just haven't taken the time to learn it. You, you, it, (laughs) it is. 
I, if one piece of advice that I can give everybody out there tonight is learn it, the FG knot. It is, it's so much better than any of the other ones for coming off your reel. It's, a, you know, it's the only way to go. It's, it's not even a knot. It's just, it's like a Chinese cinch knot. And it just never, if you tie it right, it just never fails. And it's made a big difference for me for my blade or uh, braid to fluorocarbon connection. I made you try it. Oh, so, oh, sorry. Hey, we got a question from Chris Fryer uh, for Ed when he says, what are your two favorite, uh, two to three favorite uh, Berkeley baits for this time of year? Oh, man. Uh, you know, this time of year, you know, with fish, you know, down here where we're at, getting ready to spawn and those kinds of things, you got to think about a, a like a the Berkeley General. It's version of a stick worm um, is a really, really great bait. Um, the pit boss is another great bait as far as flipping in bushes down here, you know, letting the bait sit when fish are spawning. Um, and then you'd have to throw in like a, man, it'd be, it'd be tough between a top water and like a war pig, a war pigs, their version of, of a lipless crankbait. And, uh, um, you know, it's just hard to beat that, you know, pre spawn bite with a lipless crankbait. I just, I love it. And, uh, it's a lot of fun to throw. That's awesome. Hey, uh, we have a, a question from Troy Roach for both of you guys. Uh, would you, yeah, you know, what uh, what advice do you have on fishing as a co angler? I mean, meaning, uh, how do you be more successful as a co angler? Is the way I, I guess I read that question. You go first, Kevin. Okay, so the biggest thing is is watch the guy on the front of the boat real close. See how efficient he is. If you're going down the bank and he's flipping bushes. You don't want to flip the same bushes with the same bait behind them. You got to throw something different or you got to fish the stuff that's in between. You want to pick apart the, the things that they're leaving, you know, but if you're out on a big expanse of grass flat and say he's throwing a red eye shad and catching them like that, you can probably do the same thing right behind him because he can't cover every square inch of it. So, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing is just pay real close attention to the guy in the front and do what he's not doing. Um, you know, in between those areas and where it's, it is more open, uh, you can, you know, you can do what's, the, you know, what he's doing and still be successful. I'll add to that. That's a great point, Kevin, all, all everything that you said. Um, you know, I've always said that I think the fastest way to become the best fisherman you possibly can is to be a co-angler and just to learn as much as you can off all the different anglers and uh, I think that's the biggest thing as co-anglers is to just to try to learn. And if you yep. take that day and you approach that day and you, you tell the, the, the guy in the front of the boat, hey, man, I'm just here to learn. He's going to open up to you more than, than a guy that says, hey, I, are you on fish? I, I need to catch 20 pounds. And, and, you know, what do I need to do? And, and you know, somebody that's real aggressive. So I, I look at it as, as a guy that's going to be laid back and, and just, you know, let that just learn good or bad off any of those pros that you possibly can. And then just to add a little bit to what Kevin was saying, you know, if a guy is flipping bushes, a lot of times they have a tendency to flip one side of it or the same side of it, or they only, you know, they flip it in there and they, they bring it up, let it go back to the bottom and, and then reel it in, you know, as a co-angler, maybe you need to up your weight size to where you get, you get a faster fall or maybe just leave it in that bush two or three times longer than that pro or the guy in the front of your boat is doing, or just like Kevin said, do something completely different. Try to get a reaction strike, you know, a, a top water or, or a wacky worm, you know, a slower bite out in front of that stuff. So, you know, and that's just all in a bush scenario, but there's always little intricacies that you can do differently and uh, put a whooping on the guy in the front a lot of times. <laughs> hey, Michael Cummins asked, uh, he says, what's the, he has a problem finding the right speed when he's cranking. I guess uh, it'd be interesting to hear both of you guys approach on this. I mean, what, how do you, how do you narrow down the speed for that day that you're on the water and the bait that you're using? Go ahead. You're the, you're the cranking man. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, you are by all no, means. So. so speed definitely, uh, you know, speed kills for sure. And it's really about this time of the year, the water temperature, um, the conditions that you have, but uh, you know, once the water warms up, faster is usually better than slower. But it's it can vary. I mean, uh, the cover that you're in, you know, so, you know, sometimes if you're in thick grass, you're cranking grass or something like that, you need to slow it down just because it's hard for the fish to find the bait. You know, you want it to rip free, to stop, you know, to deflect off the cover a little bit more. So the biggest thing is experiment until you get a positive reaction, until you get a good bite. And the way they bite the bait should tell you if you're doing it right or wrong. You know, if they're barely hooked and just with one little hook and the, you know, the back hook on the tip of their lip, 
they didn't really, you know, you didn't get them to really react real well to it. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing is paying real close attention to that, varying that speed. I'm changing speeds a lot, I'm trying to get that bait to deflect off the cover, starting and stopping a lot, doing a lot of different things until they can. I prefer um, for the majority of the crankbait fishing that I do, I use a six, two to one reel that brings in 25 inches per turn. And I'm just, I'm a little more aggressive than some people. I like to wind that fast. It's just, it's my comfort level. It's what I've grown accustomed to. I know a lot of people like to use a faster reel and, and try to force themselves to slow down. My nature is that I'm pretty high, strong and pretty fast paced. So I need a little bit slower reel than most people. And, and I kind of speed myself up. Uh, for it, but I just love the feel that I get out of that. I got a story for everybody that goes right along with this question. So we're at an event at Lake Gunnersville, and Kevin dominates this event. And the water temperature, correct me, if, correct me, I'm not going to be 100 percent on this, but it's like in the mid 40s, like mid to high 40s. And you know, I leave that event, that event, scratching my head, but I remember a few bass that I caught. It'd be that last 10 feet and I'd reel that bait in real fast and make another cast and one would get it. Well, Kevin ends up winning the event or doing really good and he's burning that lipless crankbait, you know, that entire week in a, in a situation where, you know, me as a, as a younger angler back, this was 10, 15 years ago, I was thinking, man, colder water, slow it down a little bit. But that bass told me, hey, right that last 10 feet you know, you need to reel it faster. And, and, and am, am I right, Kevin, you won that event or did really good burning that lipless crankbait in really cold water. So like, as Kevin says, you've got to just experiment just because it's maybe cold water. A lot of times, yeah, it could be a stop and a go and a slow retrieve, but then there's also times with those high pressure systems that you've got to burn that bait to get those fish to react. Yeah. You always got to experiment and listen to the fish. You know, when, you know, the it's all about, uh, paying attention to exactly what you were doing when you get a bite. It doesn't matter if you're flipping, cranking, drop shot and whatever, you know, whatever you, you know, were doing when that fish bit, you want to duplicate it again. I still am going to keep experimenting, but when you get that real positive response, that's pattern fishing 101 is just to duplicate yeah. the same scenario. Hey, Junior Figueroa asked a question. He says, when the pros say, and I heard this multiple times already this week, uh, that the bass weren't positioned right, what exactly does that mean? Explain that uh, for, for questions. And and by the way, this is the winning question for uh, Kevin has picked this as the winning question for a College of Bass Yeti Rambler. So, Junior, uh, we'll, we're going to need you to uh, send us your address so we can ship you one. But it's a great question for both you guys. Go ahead, Jim. You, okay. So <laughs> a lot of it is um, if we, you know, when I see them cranking, for instance, and and they go through and, and side image a school of fish on a ledge or whatever, I want to see them, you know, set up on that structure, you know, on break. And when I say structure, structure to me is not a brush pile or rocks or that structure is a depth change. It's a contour change. And, you know, if they're suspended five foot off the bottom above it or off the edge, that's not in a feeding zone. You know, you want them, you know, pretty much right down near the bottom and right on the highest spot. That means they're in the zone where they're in position to ambush, you know, a pot of shad or anything that's coming by like that. And when I see that, it's like, yep, I know it's going to be game on. So, um, and that doesn't mean that you can't catch them, but when they're in that mode and they're in that zone, they're going to be more aggressive. The strike zone's bigger. They're, they're going to be chasing and it's easier to, to catch them. If they're not, then you got to use a different technique. And, um, you know, that's why you, where you'll see guys use some of these other baits, like a spy bait, for instance, when they're up off the bottom, uh, to, you know, you know, to catch them. So it's, it's something that just comes with a lot of experience, um, and, and heartache from having, you know, knowing the bass are there and you, and you don't catch them or you only catch one or two and, or you bust up the school, you know, so it's just, uh, you, you want to more concentrated and more locked onto the, onto that structure. You know, for me this week, it, it, you know, and I don't want to say too much about the week because we're both still competing, but there just seems to be a lot of fish in positions that that they're not normally. They're, you know, maybe in the center of a drain or suspended out off the grass, out out away from a piece of structure where, you know, in the we want to see them 
over that structure. We want to see them on the outside edge or on that inside edge or, or positioned in those areas. And, and then all of a sudden you'll see them out there on that active target. You'll see them bust out in the middle of a pocket where those fish are, you know, they're not yet committed going up to the bank. So, you know, for me, that's when those fish get in those positions that, that man, I'd, I'd rather them be somewhere else because it makes them a lot more uh, uh, patternable or easy to duplicate, and easy to catch. Yeah, it just it helps when they're set up the way we want them to. It just it, it makes it a lot easier to be more efficient. You know, you don't have to fan cast everywhere. You know where the target zone's at, right? Like say, right to the edge of the grass or the right on the drop or whatever the you know whatever the cover structure is that you're fishing. So. Um, when they're when they're roaming around and suspended, that's when it gets to be a challenge. So we got one last question, Edwin. Before we got to go, I know you got to get ready for tomorrow. But hey, uh, Jeff Cox asks, he's what's the number one thing you're looking for uh, when you're running down the lake you're not familiar with? You know, that's always something that I just want to find something that I'm comfortable with. You know, something that I have confidence in. If if, if Jeff, if you're a, a really good dock fisherman and, and you're running down a lake and you see all kinds of laydowns and riprap, but then you get to a few docks, I mean, start with something that you have confidence in that you've had experience in. You know, maybe it's like what Ott Defoe does and, you know, Ott and all those cup events, it seems like he's running way up the rivers or, or uh, you know, just do something that you have confidence in, you know, Kevin was talking about Hackney earlier. You know, Hackney is very, very confident with a jig and fishing slow. You know, Kevin's super confident with a crankbait and covering water really quick. Um, I think that's the main thing that I try to do. I just want to get somewhere, get someplace that I can relate to, put four or five baits in that I have confidence in, no matter where I'm at in the country, um, and just fish those baits and, and, and get a bite doing something that I am familiar with and something that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, that's – exactly right you know the biggest the biggest thing i try to do is find areas that that fit the seasonal pattern i mean the foundation of of every pattern and breaking down any lake is is fishing the right water for that seasonal pattern in the current conditions that you have so you know when you go out here just like this week at rayburn we know the general seasonal pattern is is the spawn or pre-spawn uh, we know the lake has you know it's got grass it's got timber it's got bushes in the water um, but knowing that the fish want to to spawn you know you want to look at areas that have those the right ingredients before you even stop the fishing area so and then it's just about picking baits that are efficient to cover the zone that you're fishing whether it's an outside grass line or you're flipping bushes hey bob ball just uh, sent in a question a few seconds ago he says the full moon's coming soon how does that affect bass fishing yeah. the moon is a is a much bigger influence than i think uh, a lot of people give it credit for, especially this time of year, and not just for bass, but for everything in nature. You know, whether it's a, you know, whether you're, if you're a deer hunter, and Edwin's a big deer hunter as well, too, you know how important the full moon is for every cycle, whether it's when the crawfish molt or when the shad spawn or when the bluegill spawn. So you see these peak activity periods in the spring for every species on these full moon periods like that. And what happens when you have a full moon? Uh, during the, the key spawning time when the water temperatures are right like this is you're going to have a lot of fish do it. And they get in weird moods at times where they don't want to feed anymore. They won't chase a bait and they're, you got to kind of use that instinctive or that protective instinct against them just to make them react. You know, instead of using a, a slow, uh, lightweight jig, you might use a heavy jig just to drop it on their head in that, in that bush just to make them react to it or, uh, you know, a faster moving presentation because, they they don't react to something real slow or it's the exact opposite you know when they're locked down on a bed you got to put something in there that they just can't tolerate there anymore but they do get real weird um when the when the moon comes full i saw it last month at red crest uh down at lake ufala i was catching them with a, a straight king thunder cricket and I, on that last day when i was fishing the knockout round i had plenty of bites to have a really good day and i just couldn't keep them on because they just weren't eating the bait <laughs> Right. I mean, they were thinking about spawning and they were just slapping at it and uh, it's frustrating, but that's just, it's part of the deal. You got to understand that that's going on and adjust your, your techniques to it. I mean, that's when, you know, a bait like a jerk bait or a crank bait with multiple treble hooks, if you can get them to react to it, a lot of times you can, you can still catch them. So where with a single hook bait, like a jig, um, it's, you might miss some. 
Yeah. Hey, Edwin, I know we're running out of time, so I got one last question for you. Uh, Steve Rose asked, is our fish attractions worth it uh, with soft plastics? I know you're you're running the, the Max Scent and, and the Power Bait, so just wanted your thoughts uh, to how you would answer this one. 100%, you know, we've seen all the success of Max Scent, you know, on those smallmouth fisheries, and and I think people are just now seeing the, the advantage of that Max Scent with, with largemouth, with the green side of fish, but um, I spent a lot of time up there at Spirit Lake at the Berkeley facilities, and I'm just blown away by the scientific research that they put into it all. And, uh, you know, I think it's just one more tool that an angler can have to make them more confident. You know, if you're not getting a lot of bites and, 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 and confidence, I feel like is everything. I mean, you talk to Kevin, I mean, Kevin's built a career on, on just being more confident than everybody else. And, and if you have more confidence in your bait and it's due to having some scent in it, and by all means, it's going to help you. So uh, um, I'm a full believer in it 100%. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, Edwin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to be watching uh, watching you t tomorrow uh, as you guys are out there. Uh, so looking forward to it. Good luck. And uh, thanks for coming on uh, College of Bass tonight. Appreciate thanks it, Edwin. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for the cup, too. I got one of these great cups. If you guys want to support a great cause, go get you one of these cups right here. They're really, really cool. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you giving me one. Yeah. Thanks again. Boy, I, I don't know how. I mean, obviously, a great angler, as in all the guys are on MLF. I mean, you, your accomplishments when you when you see who you're fishing against are just even more amazing. So that's uh, that's 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 pretty cool. He's a fun guy to be with. Yeah, Ed, Edwin's a really hard worker. Um, he puts it all in. He has an extreme passion for it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, his success has proved it. I mean, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Edwin's a, a perfect example of that. So, Hey, uh, we got a bunch more viewer questions. I want to get to as many as we can. So we'll be a little more rapid fire. But uh, Brad Drennan has a question. He says, hey, are you ever going to put a book out on bass fishing? And I'm like, uh, go to Amazon, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have a couple of different books that, that we've uh, put out. And it's just, you know, in today's age, though, people want their content more real time. So I'm spending a lot more time doing, you know, videos and YouTube videos and things like that to, to try to teach people. I think that's one of the things that um, uh, that I'm pretty good at. So I, I'm going to continue to to keep putting out a lot of content just like this. The, you know, the College of Bass, so many people, uh, they just want to learn, you know, and, and I love seeing people be successful. That's my, you know, my, the most gratifying thing about all this is just like when people come back and say, man, I tried the technique you told me about, or that I watched this video you did. And I went out and, you know, my dad caught his biggest bass or we had a great day on the water. I took my kid and he caught his first one, you know, and that's what it's all about. It's just, you know, getting people to have a better experience out there on the water and be more successful. So if somebody, that book still is available though, isn't it? Yeah. The, the one with Louis Stout? Yeah. Yep. Kevin Van Damme's Bass Strategies. You betcha. That's awesome. Hey, we got another question from Vicki Dixon uh, Oberding. She says, uh, how do you determine where to start in the water column? Yeah, a, a big thing with that is is really that seasonal pattern, you know, and the type of lake that, you, that you're at, you know. Uh, so it's not where you start in the water column, but it's, it's how deep you, you should start. You know, I mean, in the summer months when the fish are more related to offshore structure, you got a lot more to look at because there's always some fish shallow and there's obviously a population deep, but in the spring and the fall, you know, you're, there's always going to be some shallow fish and usually a whole lot of them. So it's just really breaking down the conditions and the seasonal pattern. And, you know, that's what really what my book is all about. It's all about seasonal patterns and, you know, changing conditions, how bass are affected by fluctuating water or uh, cold fronts and things like that. So it's all covered in there and uh, it's a science. It's far from exact. I'm far from, uh, you know, a know-it-all in every case, because I promise you, I still learn every single time out in the water myself, but uh, there are some, some, some basic guidelines that will, will help you really get on the right track a lot quicker by just following the basic seasonal patterns. So Terry Calhoun had a uh, comment that had cracked me up. So I thought you'd get a kick because you all just keep on doing this program. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been, it's been a blast. Uh, you know, we, it goes so fast every, every week, you know, the, the time flies uh, and, and I, you know, I enjoy doing it. So I'm sure 
that it's probably will not be the last that we do things like this. Plano's really, really hit on something. When they started College of Ice, uh, they saw right away. I think you did, you, did, you and Brian and uh, and Chris Russell, who's the you know Chris is the marketing manager there. It's yeah. he's the genius behind all of this, and it's it's been uh, it's been fun for us. But I, again, I think it's really helping people catch more fish, whether you're ice fishing or or you're bass fishing. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, we got a question from Brian Cyrus. Uh, he, it's actually addressed to me. He says, "Do you uh, do you recommend the Garmin Striker Four for a beginner tech guy?" And and actually, this is the winning question. So, uh, Brian, you're also going to get a College of Bass Yeti Rambler tonight for the question. But you know, uh, I guess my question on this is: Yeah, the, the Striker Four is a is a small uh, entry level um, machine, and it's, and it's awesome. But if I'm in a boat, I want a, a larger screen. I want a five, six, seven inch, even nine inch screen because it's easier to see. And truthfully, the tech uh, at Garmin is is very easy to use in terms of intuitive. The buttons are easy. Uh, I know Humminbird is the same way. So I wouldn't be afraid of the tech. I, I would go out and buy what you need. And uh, it doesn't take that much to learn either of them. So it um, that's what owner's manuals are for. But it's really, they are very simple to, to do it. Hey, Kevin, this is another question for you. Uh, he said, uh, from Michael Clemens, he says, how often are the maps updated? Oh, so like the Hummingbird Lake Master maps. So, yeah, yeah. they're constantly, uh, they're constantly, you know, doing new lakes. And then occasionally they do go back and scan some of the lakes that, that they haven't done in, in quite a while. And you can see um, the version on the Lake Master map on it. So like if you're at a, a retail store, um, you can see if it's version two, three, four, five, whatever it is. And, uh, you, you know, the best thing to do is go to the Humminbird site, go to the Lake Master uh, section, and you'll see for the region of the country what the most current version is, most updated version. And unfortunately, they're not updatable. It's not like you can go in and download new information when they do it. It's, it's really not that often um, that, you know, they, they come out with a, a new version, but they are scanning more and more lakes all the time. They're doing more and more lakes. Um, you know, I know a lot of the smaller lakes and things like that, it, That's they just didn't have time to get to them. It, I mean, it physically, it's time consuming. It's a huge investment for them because you they actually go out with they a boat back, just yeah, absolutely. back and forth and they can do it a little faster than we can. But still, I mean, you got to cover, you go to a place like Sam Rayburn here. I mean, the Lake Master map here is absolutely unbelievable. It shows everything shore to shore every the river channel the creek channel every hump every turn every and it's it's mapped to a t so when you got 115,000 acres to scan like that it's it doesn't take weeks it takes months for them to do a lake like this so it's it's time consuming and they're constantly uh you know working on more new lakes but right now um you know the the maps are are really detailed and i know they they're working on certain uh certain areas of the country, but it's mostly mapping new lakes instead of lakes that they've already done. Once they've got it down, I mean, it's pretty hard to make it any better. Yeah. Hey, here's an actual great question, and probably, hopefully timely one for you as well, but uh, do you fish a lake differently during the week on less pressured days versus the weekend on a more pressured uh, great question. Yeah, it, no doubt. I mean, you got to be aware of the pressure out there. And I'll tell you, I, I fish a lot of places and, you know, Lake Fork in the spring is a place that gets a lot of pressure. But when I came here uh, on the weekend and our practice day was Friday and Saturday, I was blown away by the number of people on the water. I mean, literally thousands of bass fishermen, you go into any creek or pocket and there was a boat every hundred yards. So it's it's hard to go down the bank behind that many boats and, and expect that you're going to be super successful um, it, with with that. So it's something I, you know, take a look at and I try to do things differently. I try to fish areas that are different than what all the, you know, the local pressure is happening. But no doubt that, you know, fishing on a Tuesday or a Wednesday is a lot better than on a Saturday. But most people have to work during the week. So you got to go when you can go. And, um, you know, that's. That's what what I tell people is there's no substitute for time on the water, but be aware of what where they're at, what they're doing, and try to do something different if you can. Great, great comment. Hey, one of the uh, strongest followers of a uh, College of Bass has been Lee Kimball. He's been on every week, and you made a comment last week that really stuck with me as well. You said fishing is hard, and I think that's one of the reasons that you like it. I know it's one of the reasons I like it because it, it the fact that it isn't easy. It takes effort. And I think that's a, a great comment. 
Yeah, no doubt. It, it, it's um, it's challenging to go out and be successful every single time. And, and you know, tournaments are a way to measure that, you know, to measure yourself against uh, other great anglers. And that's that's what I love about it. To me, the thrill in bass fishing is I mean, I love to catch them just like you do and everybody else does. But the thrill for me is figuring them out, figuring out the pattern, um, you know, learning what they're doing because they don't, you know, talk and they, they you know, they you can't really. Uh, see yeah. them for the most part. It's yeah. a you know you're you're making educated guesses to 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 figure out where they're at. And so when you have a great day and and you you know you catch them real good, it's it's really gratifying. And it isn't easy. And it's it's hard to be consistent day after day after day. And uh, that's why when you got a field like we do here at the Bass Pro Tour of 80 guys, you're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win because you know the 79 other guys are out there working just as hard or tr you know trying to work just as hard and. Uh, uh, and there can only be one winner at the end of the week. So when you do get there and you're up on the on the stage and you got that trophy, it makes it all worthwhile. Hey, before I bring up this next question, uh, a few years back we were on the Great Lakes fishing uh, smallmouth, and we found this massive school, and I, I made a cast out, and I caught out like a four or five pound smallmouth. I thought we were absolutely going to kill them, and about twenty minutes goes by, no bites. Half hour goes on, no bite. Then I snagged a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> And so here, this question that's uh, from Bill Dowry says, how do you know you're marking bass as compared to white bass or other species? Yeah, a lot of it for me is, again, through experience of seeing how um, the, the fish are set up on the structure. You know, you'll see white bass really grouped up. They'll typically be high off the bottom. They move a lot. Um, you know, they're, co they're covering ground. You'll see like the Asian carp the same way down in Kentucky Lake or in the Tennessee River. They won't be down on the bottom. What I'm looking for when I see bass is, you know, you'll come up over there and side image the top of that hump and you'll see a group of four or five sitting there and they're, they're literally right on the bottom or a foot off and they're, and they're pretty tight together and they're all, you know, just, just kind of sitting there relating to a depth change. That's a pretty good indication to me that that those are going to be bass. Or if you graph a brush pile and you you see, you know, again, four or five of them in the top. If you see 50 of them there and, and the size, you can tell, too. It, you, that's the one thing you'll notice um, after you side image a lot and, and you're on the same scale. You'll you'll see relative to size. You'll, you know, you'll see, mark them. You go in there and you fish that brush pile and you catch four or five and you go, well, hey, these are all three and four pounders. So you, you see in relative size how they looked on your screen to what, when you put them in your hand, you, you got a pretty good idea. So it comes with experience, but mostly it's how they're related to the bottom and to the structure. Hey, uh, we're running, believe it or not, we're running out of time already. I want to, I want to bring in a, a very special guest tonight. Uh, everybody knows him as bro. He's uh Brian Rosedale, full-time ice fishing and open water guide in Northern Minnesota. And, uh, co-host on College of Ice. Bro, man, it's good to see you. Hey, good to see you guys. Great show. couple of legends and uh, one of the best ever in bass. Uh, it's, it's fun to be here talking to you guys right now from the icy north. Well, hey, I, how much? Are you still on the lakes? Uh, you can get out on some, but I wouldn't. It's, it's very unsafe right now. We got an early ice out. And just on your show here, not too long ago, we were talking about snowstorms in bass country. And up here, we're talking about ice out now. So the world is mixed up right now. But I want to tell you, we still get big bass through the ice. You have to have a big <laughs> hole to fit them. <laughs> That's impressive. So, you know, the, the craziest thing is when I posted a picture a few years ago of a largemouth bass on ice, people just flipped out from the south. They're like, how can you do that? You know, they, they just think that they go dormant. And that's the one thing that being from the north has taught me is how active bass are in real cold water or even under the ice. You know, I mean, uh, just because it's froze on top, the water temperature doesn't change, you know, down there, especially if you got a little depth to the area at all. And uh, I'm amazed at how aggressive they can be even in that cold water. I mean, the day the ice went out in Michigan before I came down here to Texas, I was out with a buddy and we absolutely hammered them. Um, and they were deep. It was a real clear lake. You know, they were a lot of more 25, 30 feet deep, but they were super. I mean, the bite on that swim bait was like, Pook! you know, you they weren't just easing up to it and barely putting it in their mouth. They were choking it. It's fun catching them on this, this light tackle. They got nowhere to go. Uh, the, the, the weeds have laid down. So you, you could use lighter tackle and catch big fish. Uh, so largemouth bass are open all year. They close with walleyes. Right now, everything's closed except for panfish and sturgeon. 
uh, except on border waters. But uh, we chase bluegills this time of year and all that stuff. But smallies close in September, and they keep it closed all the way through, and it doesn't open until walleye opens. So in the wintertime, I avoid smallies. They, they tend to school up in huge numbers on rock piles, and it, it's fun, but I don't want to take away from all the fun that everybody could have in open water, and they're vulnerable, I think, in the wintertime because literally they're all there in one spot, you know, so I yeah. try to avoid it at all costs. Yeah. So, bro, I think, I, oh, so go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, no, I think, you know, these uh, the biologists in a lot of these states, they understand that's, that's why we have the later seasons in a lot of the northern fisheries because the lakes are clear. And they know they're very susceptible in their wintering areas, and they're very susceptible in their sp during the spawn. So, uh, you know, we have year-round catch and release in Michigan, and uh, they've done a lot of studies on on that before they opened it up. And it's just made incredible opportunities for a lot more anglers, and people are taking advantage of it and learning that they're a lot more active and aggressive when you, people didn't think you could catch them. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun where you're at right now. A little bit of pressure, but we know yeah. you'll do good. You've, you've, you've had great a great record on that body of water, and let's see it. Let's see it happen now. I am doing – uh, you promise me I'll be, I'll be <laughs> swinging at him tomorrow in the morning. That's awesome. Hey, bro, uh, we're going to be launching the College of Ice again next fall, so looking forward to doing that and uh, looking forward to working with you on that. So that's going to be awesome. So, hey, thanks for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Good luck, Kevin, and we'll see you later, Steve. Thank you. Brian Brosdahl, that's pretty awesome. Hey, Kevin, we had a, just a couple more questions I wanted to get to. Um, one of the questions that was from Brian uh, uh, Sawanis, the guy who won uh, last week, he said, what's a good sweep speed to have on the, the Mega 360? So I I keep I run, like to run mine fast. I want to see a refresh often. A lot of it is exactly how I'm fishing, but like here at Sam Rayburn, um, I'm, I'm glued to it all day long you you watch if you watch me out there on the live stream you know i've got my head down i'm looking at that 360 and i'm i'm following these grass lines i'm looking for uh schools of bait or bass anything to you know to direct my next cast to so i want it to update as much as possible you know as fast as possible i'm just getting a a, a quicker return that way on on it and it's kind of the same way um you know on your on your side imaging you know i want to i want to run that I do everything fast. I want to. I want to see the most updated, fastest information that I can um, as I'm going uh, out there on the water. So I I like to have that speed up. The Mega 360 is just like you know. I mean, you you're doing the same thing with yours. It's just such an awesome tool to see the structure around the boat, to see the drops, the edges, the grass, the weeds, the fish, because you got your rod right in your hand right then, and yeah. you can you can make that cast right at that second. And that's what I do. I wait for it to show, you know, if I see something that looks real good, a little grass point uh, and, and I'm in the boats moving pretty quick, I'll slow down. And as soon as it hits that object, I'm firing. I know it's, you know, 60 feet away and it's right that exact angle and I'm making a cast right to it. It's a so fun. Hey, I have very strong feelings about this question. Now, what are your thoughts on barometric pressure when it comes to bass fishing? Is there a magic number you like to see? Uh, I don't really look, I, I like to just, follow the changes you know i mean when you have high pressure it basically goes along with the, the conditions that are tougher and the fish know in nature that hey that's not the most conducive time for me to be actively hunting for for bait or food so in in low pressure it's the exact opposite that's when they get aggressive the strike zone gets bigger they're on the prowl they're on the move um, they're chasing baits further and so you can kind of see that in the weather you know as a as a big front's approaching or a storm's coming um, you know, you got, you got low pressure and, and they'll be really active can be some of the best fishing that there is. The beauty of it is, is you don't have to be, uh, or they don't have to be active or feeding to catch them. You can make bass react even when they don't want to, you know, I mean, by dropping a bait right on their head, or, you know, using a fast fall or, use, you know, an erratic presentation or having it deflect off a rock in front of them, your crankbait or something like that. So they don't have to be feeding but it is definitely easier when they are, you know, I mean, if, if they'll run 15 feet to eat a spinnerbait, it's a whole lot better than if you got to rip the spinnerbait out of the clump of grass they're sitting in to make them react to it. So uh, yeah. parametric pressure, it goes hand in hand with their activity level. 
you know, one of the things I don't like about looking at the uh, at the barometric pressure is then you go in there with preconceived notions. I, I'd rather just let the fish say what just what's going to happen that day, and uh, so that's 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 why I say I have strong thoughts on that. I'm going to go fishing no matter what, and so right. and, and you're in the same situation. So I just don't like having any things there. Hey, yeah. one of the other questions, uh, Travis Christie has asked: uh, Do you are you using blade baits at all? Yeah, so you know, early, early in the spring, um, you know, blade baits are are deadly effective in in super cold water. And set, same thing, right at ice out, they're very good. Lipless crankbaits are kind of a, a, a similar version to it, and that's something that we carry on into it. But you know, the original silver buddy, I think, is the one that everybody knows, or maybe the head and sonar from back in the day. Uh, but they are they are really good uh, in, in that coldest water, and then. Uh, after that, it seems like they really, you know, kind of fade off. The bass are really focused on vibration. They're really focused on those flat-sided vibrating baits when the water's real cold. I think they use their lateral line a lot in cold water to help them find food, you know, whether it's a crawfish crawling on the bottom or a shad uh, near them or a bluegill or whatever it is, they are really in tune with that vibration in cold water. And that's what a blade bait is all about. It's a lot of vibration. So if you have any tips for somebody that's fishing a blade bait, how do you work the bait itself? Yeah, I, I'm pretty much, um, I'm going to fish it on, uh, you know, I like it on a bait caster best. I think I keep the best feel with it. Um, I type to uh, go with a little heavier line than too light a line. I don't want it to fall too fast. And it's just a lift and drop. To me, the best retrieve day in, day out is probably about a one foot hop and drop. One foot up, one foot down. I mean, in the cold water, they're pretty close. They should be locked down on the bottom. And uh, you just want to make it fall as close to them as possible as many times as you can. So, you know, a foot to 18 inches is uh, is what you want to do. I'm not ripping it up five feet and letting it go back down, just short hopping it on the bottom. So it's just like whoop, 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 right down the, the break or the edge uh, where you think they're at. And again, position the boat so that you can keep that bait in the zone where you think the bass should be setting for the whole cast if possible. Hey, uh, this is actually bittersweet. We're running out of time, so we're going to have to uh, uh, say good night to everybody. Uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Kevin. I want to thank you. I want to thank Chris Russell. And I also like to thank all the viewers that have tuned in uh, by the thousands this uh, the last several weeks. It's been it's really incredible. A couple of reminders is if you do want to take advantage of that speed bag uh, special and, and, and pick up some absolute awesome products uh, for storing soft plastics and get a College of Bass Yeti mug, I would recommend you move on that quickly because we're going to run out uh, of mugs uh, fairly soon. But that, that special runs through uh, Sunday. And also, if you want to catch College of uh, Bass, all of the episodes are available on YouTube on both the uh, Plano Fishing uh, channel as well as Kevin's uh, channel as well. Uh, so uh, if you really want to go back and study what's been talked about, and, and we really have gone in depth on a lot of topics over the last several weeks. So yeah. I can't believe it's already been eight weeks. I mean, it just goes every week. It's something I look forward to and it just goes, you know, just goes so fast. And if you're looking to get an edge, all you got to do is watch the past episodes of College of Bass, right? <laughs> get your edge. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Kevin, good luck the rest of the week. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the chance to uh, work with you on this. And everybody, we do have to pick the winner, by the way. Uh, let me check. Did we get this one figured out? We do have a winner. We have Don uh, Krona from Rhode Island is the winner tonight, and congratulations. We'll, uh, Don, we'll need your uh, to private message us through Plano to get us your address, and we'll get that shipped right out. But uh, everybody, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for joining us the last eight weeks. And, Kevin, uh, again, it's been a real honor working with you. You bet, Steve. It's been fun. I appreciate it. You put a lot of hard work into it. You do the hard work being the producer and Kai in the background, getting everything up there and getting it all set, getting the graphics and things like that. So it's a total team effort, but uh, I've had a blast and been real proud to be part of it. And again, it's just uh, it's great with a company like Plano. They've got the best tackle management systems out there available. If you have not looked at all the different edge products, and I can tell you they've got some new ones coming this year for ICAST. They got some new stuff. I've already gotten some samples of them. I've got to see some of them. So the edge is going to continue. That's awesome. Yep. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Good luck fishing. And uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you down, or, down the road. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching The College of Bass. Join us for an all-new episode every Wednesday night.